Eric Erickson is a really interesting person. Though he lacked a bachelor's degree, he served as professor for some of the most prominent institutions in the United States, like Berkeley, Yale, and Harvard. And in fact, he's one of the most cited uh, researchers of the 20th century. I believe he's like the 12th most cited. The majority of his work, the stuff that we still talk about today, are his ideas on human development. And these ideas are what we now call the psychosocial theory of development. And here's how it works. It's got eight stages. And during each stage, the individual is challenged with a new developmental task and psychosocial dilemma that they must overcome. And if they can meet that challenge, if they can overcome those tasks, accomplish those tasks, then they will continue to develop in a healthy manner. But if they struggle at some point, or if they just simply cannot accomplish those tasks that are set out for them, then they could develop some kind of disorder, perhaps. So success or failure at each one of these stages can have long-lasting consequences. Now, the first stage is what we often just call trust. You can also call it trust versus mistrust. Because what the person is needing to learn here is just how to be able to trust another person. This occurs from the ages of about zero to one. And Erickson observed that children are completely dependent on others. And depending on how those others interact with them, they will be able to develop a healthy kind of relationship prototype, the ability to trust other people. So if children are raised properly during this early stage of life, then they'll grow up to be able to treat others in a similarly healthy way. But if they are not, if they're neglected, if they're abused, then they'll grow up to be similarly neglectful and abusing. They're learning at this beginning stage how to interact with other humans. Stage two is what we call autonomy, or autonomy versus shame and doubt. So this is between the ages of zero or one to three. And when I say autonomy, I just mean learning the ability, learning that they have the ability to accomplish things on their own, learning to do things for themselves. So children need to be able, be able to try things on their own. Oftentimes they will fail and it's important for adults, uh, their parents and caregivers to support them. You know, don't ridicule them for failure just assist them in accomplishing their own goals. This will teach them a healthy sense of autonomy. And as they grow older, they will be more willing and more proactive when it comes to solving their own problems, less dependent on others. Stage three is called initiative, or initiative versus guilt. That's between the ages of three to six. And this is where children will really start to ask a lot of questions. They'll show a lot of curiosity. They'll want to explore and learn and experiment. And parents and caregivers, they need to foster this inquisitiveness, this in imagination. Children who are made to feel guilty for wanting to try new things and go to new places and ask new questions, they'll basically just close up on themselves. And as they grow older, they won't want to be a burden on others. They'll kind of just live in their own world and be less interested in trying new things. Stage four is industry or industry versus inferiority. This is in between the ages of six to 12. And what children will naturally want to demonstrate at this age is a sense of industry, you know, a willingness, a desire to be productive, to be helpful. So children will develop a healthy sense of industry if they are praised for their efforts. You know, kids of this age, they do want to do various kinds of things like paint pictures and draw pictures and put, you know, do their little projects and they want to get praised for it. They want to feel like they're being helpful. They just have that natural inclination to want to give back to their family and be a provider uh, in a sense. But what parents oftentimes don't understand 
many parents do, but what a lot of parents don't seem to understand is that it doesn't matter if they did a good job. It doesn't matter if it's actually helpful or not. What matters is they're trying. They're trying to be helpful and that's what they need to be rewarded for. If they aren't, if their efforts are mocked or dismissed, then the child will just not want to try anymore. They'll kind of give up on trying to be helpful and they'll withdraw from the family in that sense. And that withdrawal will continue into adulthood. Stage five is when we get to the teenage years. <clears throat> uh, we call this identity or identity versus role confusion. And what Erickson noted is that when children reach this point in their life, they have a lot of deep like existential questions that they need to try to resolve. Unfortunately, a lot of the times uh, parents aren't a part of this quest for identity, but they can and they should be. Parents should be there to help support their kids to try to figure out, you know, like what kind of life they want to have in the future, what kind of friends they might want to spend time with. And the hard, tricky part for parents is just figuring out that good balance between, you know, autonomy and uh, the other things we talked about and this quest for identity. A lot of parents will just tell their teenage children what they should do and why, but they won't really listen. And it's important that you have that kind of interaction. You need to let the child have some autonomy when it comes to trying to resolve these questions. Now, moving into young adulthood, now we're in stage six of Erickson's uh, uh, model. This is what we call intimacy, or intimacy versus isolation. But when we talk about intimacy, we're not necessarily talking about anything physical or sexual. We're just talking about building a connection. You know, the focus of young adult life, according to Erickson, is that you have built some good, strong relationships with at least a few, one, one or a few other individuals. Now, this could be in the form of a romantic relationship, like a marriage, but that's not really the point. The point is you feel like you're part of something. You feel a connection. Young adults who don't develop these connections with their peers, they'll just feel isolated. They'll feel ignored. They'll feel alienated. And that generally leads to a lot of hostility and further withdrawal from society. Uh, stage seven, uh, this is generativity. Gen or generativity versus stagnation. This is when we're talking about like middle adulthood to later adulthood years. The term generativity is one you're probably not familiar with, but it basically just refers to this desire to uh, you help out the younger generation. You know, this desire to want to give back to society, to raise the next generation guide the next generation. So it could be in the form of like a parent or a grandparent or a coach or a teacher. The whole idea here is these older adults, they have this natural desire to want to help out the youth. You know, they're, they're no longer concerned about their own well-being. They just want to help out the younger individuals. And that's a very healthy thing to focus on. Uh, older adults who don't shift this focus from themselves to the younger individuals, they will stagnate. You know, they will generally just become increasingly more unhappy and more kind of disillusioned with life. These things that they thought would bring them happiness just aren't really giving them that satisfaction anymore. And then the last stage of life, stage eight, is integrity or integrity versus despair. So this, this is that point in life where individuals spend a lot of time just reminiscing on the choices they've made, on the episodes they've experienced in their life, and how they handled those situations. And if they feel like they've made good choices, if they feel like they've gotten good resolutions, like they've accomplished their goals and whatnot, then they'll feel integrity, you know, a sense of self-respect, and they'll look forward to this, you know, later part of their life with a sense of optimism. Like they, 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 have, they feel satisfied in a sense. But if they have any deep regrets, if they feel like they have failed to accomplish some goal or they've made some serious mistake, then they'll enter this last stage of life in a state of d despair. 
And this has some pretty serious consequences. Individuals that are more optimistic, they do tend to live longer. Not only are they healthier and happier, but they do definitely live longer. So it's important for elders to be able to focus on the positives as they move into late life. If they spend an inordinate amount of time focusing on the negatives, that is definitely going to have a serious like physical toll on their body and their well-being. So that's the basic idea of Eric Erickson's eight-stage model. And it has been heavily influential throughout psychology. And we're going to be talking about this a lot in later videos as well.